Okay, then being said, let's talk about tonight's Bible study. Today, whether you knew it or not, was the winter solstice. It may not feel any different, uh, but uh, astronomically uh, it was. And I thought it would be a good subject for us to talk about because much of the Christmas celebrations and much of the celebrations around the world, particularly in the pagan religions, centered on observing the winter solstice. So I thought that would be a good subject to talk about this evening, but something a little different. And then I'm going to connect with that uh, about the origin of the Hebrew calendar and whether it had anything to do with the winter solstice. So let's go ahead and begin uh, with a definition. This is from Wikipedia and the first few slides here I have in this PowerPoint, I'll be quoting from Wikipedia, but here's what it says. This astronomical event occurs when either of Earth's poles reaches its maximum tilt away from the sun. So it can be the North Pole tilting towards the sun. In that case, that would be um, the spring uh, or summer solstice. And then the, as you can see in that picture in the lower left-hand side, when it's the uh, Southern hemisphere that's uh, kind of tilted, uh, as you see in that photograph, that is the winter solstice. That is the shortest day of the year and the longest night. It says this happens twice yearly in the summer and winter, once in each hemisphere, the Northern and Southern. So, um, we are in the midst of winter, and this is the winter solstice for people living in Australia and other areas of the world. It's summertime. It's a totally different season than we are experiencing. I think the picture on the right-hand side of the screen may be from Stonehenge, and uh, the way those, by the ancients, those two pillars were strategically placed you can see the rising sun exactly in the center of those two pillars. So uh, continuing with the definition, it says for that hemisphere, the winter solstice is the day with the shortest period of daylight and the longest night of the year when the sun is at its lowest daily maximum elevation in the sky. And again, you can see how um, the shortest day and the longest night is connected to the way the earth is tilted. And again, that happened to be this very day that um, was uh, the winter solstice, I think earlier today. Continuing with Wikipedia, since prehistory, the winter solstice have been a significant time of year in many cultures and has been marked by festivals and rituals. It marked the symbolic death and rebirth of the sun, the gradual waning of daylight hours is reversed and begins to grow again. Some ancient monuments such as a New Grange, Stonehenge, and Cahokia Woodhenge are aligned with the sunrise or sunset on the winter solstice, end of quote. And of course, we're familiar in the church with the winter solstice and the way it was celebrated in Rome. And it was actually celebrated for a number of days leading into and past December 25th. And that was the origin of Christmas celebrations that began uh, with the winter solstice. So why would, if you lived in a pagan culture, why would you be attracted to worshiping the sun? Well, again, if you were someone who is not highly educated and you just grew up in a, in a culture of peoples who were nature oriented, you would look at the sun, and I think it's natural in that case to look at the sun and idolize it. Number one, it's in the heavens. It's, it's in the sky. It's upward. It uh, gives light. Uh, it, I don't think it takes too uh, much understanding to eventually figure out that it's a big ball of fire up there. I mean, if you're um, near a campfire, uh, you can get burned if you get too close to the flames. If you're out in sunlight too long, you can get sunburned. So I think it didn't take long for them to figure out that the sun was actually a, a huge fire in the sky. It gives light. And it also, of course, it gives warmth. Uh, the sun eventually will make crops grow. I'm sure the ancients were smart enough to figure it out that uh, the sun would help the crops to grow strong. Its presence affects the mood. 
when the sun is out, people feel better. People usually are have a lighter mood when the sun is out in, in comparison to uh, being holed up in a cave or in a dwelling. Uh, all year. This was another reason why the winter solstice was a time of celebration. Uh, the rising and setting of the sun pictures the perpetual cycle of life. So almost all human cultures had a god of the sun. Virtually all human cultures worshipped the sun. Again, if you were in nature and you lived in rural communities, if you lived uh, with a group of people, uh, eventually you would get to the point where you would uh, worship the sun and look at it as something to be idolized. Uh, getting back to Wikipedia, I just wanted to give you one example. This is Newgrange in Ireland. Uh, I'd actually like to go and uh, see this someday. Uh, it's an exceptionally grand passage tomb built during the Neolithic period around 3200 BC. That's a long time ago, making it older than Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. It is aligned on the winter solstice sunrise. When you look at that picture to the right, there is a room that becomes flooded only one day out of the year, literally flooded. And that is, you got it, that happens on the winter solstice. And this was built with a crack in its ceiling that is perfectly aligned with the sun as it rises uh, during the winter solstice sunrise. It says New Grange is the main monument in the Bruna Boyne complex. It's a world heritage site. So that's an example. Uh, Stonehenge is another example of what they think was used for of the winter solstice. And there are many in China. They have another number of examples. So this was kind of a universal celebration by many peoples and many cultures. And that includes Canaan from the Holman Bible Dictionary. I'm sure there have been many times in the scriptures where you've come across a god whose name was a Molech. Well, Molech happened to be a combination of a sun god and a fire god. <clears throat> and again, I made that connection earlier how, about how it's only logical if you've experienced sunburn to realize that the sun can get very hot and that it is a, in essence, it's a ball of fire. So here's what the Holman Bible Dictionary said about Molech. They say, quote, it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word related to the word for king but describing a foreign god or a practice related to foreign worship. And here's what it says continuing. Now, this isn't very pretty, <clears throat> but um, I, it was in there and I thought it just gets the point across about why God was so against uh, Molech and uh, people uh, putting their children through the fire, which is again, a phrase that you find in numerous times in the Old Testament. Quote, in times of apostasy, some Israelites, apparently in desperation, made their children, quote, go through the fire to Molech, and it gives a number of scriptural references. It generally is assumed that references like these are to the sacrifices of children in the Valley of Hinnom at a site known as Topheth, and Topheth probably men's fire pit in Syriac. Precisely how this was done is unknown. Some contend that the children were thrown into a raging fire. Certain rabbinic writers describe a hollow bronze statue in the form of a human, but with the head of an ox. According to the rabbis, children were placed in the structure, which was then heated from below, and drums were pounded to drown out the cries of the children. What a terrible, a barbaric, a pagan ritual that would be. And that's certainly why God warned against it and condemned uh, Israel to make sure that they didn't put their children uh, through the fire. <clears throat> uh, the Molech was a Ammonite sun god, and again, uh, also a god of fire. There was a connection there. Here are a few other verses from the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, 
nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Chapter 20, verse 2. Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel are of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And as you probably guessed already, if God says don't do it, uh, the Israelites uh, would do it. And uh, Jeremiah, in his commentary, chapter 32, verse 25, this is from the New Century Version, in the valley of ben, ben Hinnom, they built places to worship Baal so they could burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to Molech. But I never commanded them to do such a hateful thing. It never entered my mind that they would do such a thing and cause Judah to sin. So unfortunately, uh, Judah did um, send their children through the fire, uh, again, which was a horrible way to die and just a terrible abomination in God's eyes that uh, human beings would do that. Here is a statement from uh, 2 Kings chapter 23. Now, this was one thing that Josiah did. Uh, this was one of his reforms. This happened approximately 630 BC, 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 10. It says, and he defiled Topheth, if you remember from the previous slide, uh, that's where the sacrifices were made, uh, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. And he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord. Imagine that at the entrance to the actual temple. They have horses there that were dedicated to the, a sun god, to the sun god. So again, I'll read verse 11. Then he, this is uh, Josiah, removed the horses uh, that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in the court, and he, Josiah, burned the chariots of the sun with fire. One thing that's interesting is the name of this officer that was in the court. Uh, his name means the God Molech has given. So that's how bad it got. Uh, it's like some of the uh, deviants and perverts that our government uh, highlights and shows off uh, who serve in government now. It's like uh, you have to rub it in everybody's nose. And uh, here, uh, in a spiritual sense, is an officer whose very name means the God Molech has given. Uh, the reason that these horses were here and these chariots is in pagan religions, the sun traveled through the sky and it was pulled by a chariot and horses. We're actually dragging the sun from sunrise to sunset. So that's the connection of why there were horses and uh, these chariots of the sun uh, near the entrance to the house of the Lord. So this was one of Josiah's reforms to clean this up uh, that was going on in Judah at the time. And then even when we go to the New Testament, this is confirmed, Israel's apostasy, re rebellion against God was confirmed in uh, Stephen's sermon before he was stoned. Here's what it, here's what it says in uh, Acts chapter 7, uh, verses 42 and 43. And then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Well, no, they didn't, but they certainly were willing to, to offer slaughtered animals and sacrifices to false gods. Verse 43, you also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Ramphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon, and that's certainly uh, what God did. Uh, that was a warning to them as uh, Stephen was repeating Israel's history and their history of rebellion against God in his sermon. So again, Molech was the god of fire and the god of the son of the ancient Canaanites, 
Uh, it had many parallels in the ancient world, may have had different names, and there were some different spellings, but um, it was always, there was always some god that was used to worship the sun, very prominent form of uh, idolatry. Uh, this is kind of an interesting sidebar, and that really doesn't have much to do with uh, the Bible study tonight, except uh, I just find it fascinating and interesting. So I thought I would wedge it in here. This is something that happened about 140 years after Moses. It happens to be one of my favorite pharaohs. Um, this was a man whose name, well, he was born Amenhotep IV, and he reigned from about 1353 to 1334 BC. He's considered the heretic pharaoh because he did something just unbelievable. Egypt was probably the most conservative nation that ever existed. For thousands of years, for example, art never changed. It was always that fl flat, one-dimensional side view of people. Uh, their governments didn't change much. The people changed. But for thousands and thousands of years, Egypt was extremely conservative. There was very little change. They actually wanted things to remain the same. And then comes this pharaoh. Uh, he abandoned the polytheism and he renamed himself Akhenaten, which me means beloved of Aten. And Aten was the disc of the sun god. And what he did is he closed down all the traditional temples. He put all of the priests of the many different gods of Egypt uh, out on the street. They were unemployed. They had to go out and get real jobs. He, he closed down all the traditional temples and he began to change the culture, including art. For the first time in art, it showed scenes of intimacy between he and his wife and his children. And the art was more realistic than it had ever been before in Egyptian culture. So he basically became a monotheist and told everyone to stop worshiping the other gods, and he worshiped the Aten. Now, most of the nation just ignored him. He founded a new capital, and he moved there, and there he called it Akhetaten. Today, it's known as Armana, and he continued to stay there throughout the rest of his life and to build the city of Armana until he died. And then when he died, uh, Egypt went back to its old ways. Uh, it uh, totally rejected him. Didn't want to have anything to do with him. They even etched his existence out of all records and monuments. We only know he exists because eventually we discovered the city of Armana. And that's where we found evidence and information of where he reigned and how he reigned and who he was and the fact that he even existed. As I said, the Egyptian culture was so conservative, they just etched him out of all records. And interestingly, a DNA evidence shows him to be the father of King Tut, one of the most uh, popular uh, pharaohs uh, in our culture today, uh, Tutankhamun. Uh, so he was his father. And again, he was erased from Egyptian history until Armana was found and uh, they could all put the puzzle pieces together and realize who he was. Uh, again, I bring this up because he did all of this after Moses. You, I have to sometimes wonder if because of the dramatic departure of the Israelites, if uh, there had been some lingering uh, monotheistic views or ideas among the Egyptian people. And I also bring this up because uh, it was the disc of the sun god that uh, he had made as the one supreme god uh, in ancient Egypt. All right, that's enough of that. More of God's instruction to Israel, though, and I think this is important. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 through 19 Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any fixture, any figure, 
the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And we'll focus on verse 19. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. So God gave the stars and the sun and the moon as something to look up and admire, uh, something to look up at that's beautiful and profound as a heritage to all the peoples on the earth. He never intended or wanted people to end up worshiping uh, those um, celestial bodies up in the sky. Uh, the Egyptians had gods for all of these heavenly objects and Israel was supposed to be different and only worship Yahweh. And he had no form as it says there in the very first verse, take heed to yourselves for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So God didn't want anything to symbolize who or what he was. He's too great for that. That's one reason the golden calves that were made by Aaron were so offensive, even though in a part of Aaron's discussion, he kind of claims this was the God who brought them out of Egypt. It's, an, it's offensive. It's an affront to God to try to represent him in any shape or any kind of form. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Obviously, that would include the sun or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Deuteronomy chapter five and verse eight. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Again, that would certainly include the sun or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And I've explained in the past sermons what is meant there by the uh, uh, the iniquity of the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, how family dysfunctions are passed on from generation to generation within the cultural uh, provision of the families. So as we can see, God made very clear instructions to Israel not to, to worship the sun, uh, not to focus on the sun as any special object. And uh, sadly, as usual, it was ignored, as we saw in the, the comments uh, by Jeremiah and Stephen. What I wanted to do with this part is, is make a little bit of a shift and be begin to talk about the Hebrew calendar, because the Hebrew calendar, uh, the Old Testament does not mention the winter solstice. That was something that I'm sure the educated, like Moses, who was educated in Egypt, were aware of it. After all, the winter solstice was observed in Egypt. But it's not something that is part of the Hebrew calendar, and then uh, we'll explain why. So let's begin talking a little bit about the Hebrew calendar, because this also is a topic that confuses many people in the church. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. So this is the instruction for the Passover in Exodus chapter 13, verse 4, the very next chapter. That month is referred to as Abib, which means a young green ear of grain. 
And it's obviously in the springtime, it correlates to what we would call March or April in our culture today. So the new year was to begin on this month of Abib and it was in the springtime. Now, obviously Moses is familiar with the month that God is talking about notice. He doesn't question God for more details. He doesn't say, God, what's a month? God, he doesn't say, God, what do you mean? Moses gets it. Moses completely understands the month and the calendar that God is referring to. What God doesn't do is he doesn't give explicit details on this brand new calendar that he's introducing to Moses for the very first time. The wording is very clear. God assumes that Moses knows exactly what this month is and what kind of and what calendar God is talking about. Now, Moses was actually familiar with two calendars. So let's see which one makes the most sense that Israel would use. First, Moses would be familiar with the Egyptian calendar, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 10, speaking of him and the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. This was, I think, his sister or his mom who had nursed him. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses, meaning because I drew him out of the water. So Moses, because he was in Pharaoh's household and considered the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have received a good Egyptian education. He would have understand, he would have understood all the intricacies of the Egyptian calendar. The Egyptian calendar did not have a seven day week. Its month had three 10 day periods for a 30 day month. The new year was in the summer. It wasn't in the beginning of the year or the fall. It was a calendar centered around the flooding of the Nile because that was life to the ancient Egyptians, the flooding of the Nile and various pagan gods. Ancient Egypt's temple of Karnak located in Luxor was built to align with the winter solstice more than 4,000 years ago. So worshiping the sun was an important part of their religion. And we talked about Akhenaten just a few minutes ago. An interesting thing about the name of Moses, uh, many believe that it's actually an Egyptian name. It's not a Hebrew name, it's root, it, that it's actually an Egyptian name. And I, to me, that would make sense that Pharaoh's daughter uh, would have given him an Egyptian name. Um, and it means drawing out of water. Now, examples of Egyptian names that are very similar to Moses are Tutmoses of which was the name of a number of pharaohs, which means the child of Toth. And even the word Ramses, we've all heard that, that's the child of Ra. And if you take the Ra off the beginning of the name, the name is Messes, which is very similar to Moses. Um, so uh, many people, many scholars believe that Moses is not a Hebrew name, that it's actually the root of it is uh, an Egyptian name. Again, meaning drawing out of water. So Moses was familiar with the Egyptian calendar, but he would also be very familiar with the Semitic calendar. Now I use the word Semitic calendar because there was a calendar that was used all throughout Palestine, Canaan, all the way up through Syria, all the way up to Babylon. It was, a, it was widely used by what we would call Semitic peoples. Exodus chapter 2 verses 15 and 16, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, uh, Moses had killed an Egyptian, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And we know, of course, that he was in Midian for 40 years before God called him to go back to Egypt to bring his people out of slavery. Verse 16, now the priest of Midian, this is Jethro, had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. So as I just mentioned, Moses would live in uh, Midian for 40 years before God would call him. The Hebrews inherited the elements of the calendar 
from their Semitic ancestors who in the earliest times had determined their months by the moon. Even large nations in Mesopotamia like Babylon began the first day of the month at the evening of the visible crescent moon. This includes those nations and scattered peoples who were in Canaan. It's a calendar they were all familiar with. It would have been the calendar that Jethro, the priest of Midian, which again is uh, just part of Canaan, south of Canaan. And uh, just an interesting phrase that doesn't tell us who said he was a priest. It doesn't tell us whose priest he was. It just assumes that he's the priest of Yahweh, even though he's independently doing his own thing and not necessarily associated with Moses, even when Moses leaves, um, he leaves Egypt. Uh, Jethro shows up at one time, he corrects Moses, he tells him he's taking too much upon himself, he eats Moses' food, he kisses his grandchildren, and he leaves, and he mysteriously disappears. So he's doing his own thing, yet he is still referred here as the priest of Midian. So this was a calendar that was used throughout this area of the world. Babylon, again, also used a Semitic calendar, and a calendar that had also a seven day week. So what are the advantages of the Semitic calendar? Well, it, the calendar begins each month with the crescent of a new moon. That's what the Hebrew calendar does. It's a unisolar calendar combining a lunar calendar with solar understanding. And I'll mention that in a little more detail in a minute. The problem with just counting through the new moons and counting 12 moons is you fall short a number of days of the year. And unless you make an adjustment of some type, in time, you would skew the seasons and you could threaten your survival. You wouldn't even be planting crops at the right time of year. Again, I'll get into that in a few minutes. So this is a unisolar calendar combining a lunar calendar and solar understanding. It has a seven day week, and that certainly will accommodate the keeping of the Sabbath. The Semitic calendar is the calendar Abraham would have used way back in the land of Ur. And later when he came to, Pal when he came to Palestine or Canaan, whatever you want to call that particular area, depending on the time in history. And some scholars believe the Israelites retained this knowledge as slaves in Egypt, meaning the knowledge of the Semitic calendar. Personally, I'm not so sure that they obviously lost knowledge of the Sabbath. God had to reintroduce it to them. Uh, they were slaves in Egypt for a long time, so I don't know if they really retained the knowledge of the Semitic calendar or not. Another advantage of it is when they would go into the promised land, the Canaanites, all the nations that would surround them used a Semitic calendar. The Israelites would be trading with these people. They would be communicating with these people. They, their neighbors to the north and the nations north of them, you know, Syria all the way up to Babylon. And they would only make sense that they would use the same calendar that these peoples used. It was the recognized way to keep time in the Mideast the Semitic calendar. So those are the advantages of using it. So what makes the Semitic calendar the Hebrew calendar or the Jewish calendar? Well, primarily God reintroduced the Sabbath and he taught Moses that there were special periods of time in this calendar when his festivals would be celebrated. And these periods of time are holy. And you go to the Old Testament and you see pretty explicit instructions in Leviticus 23 and other places on how to count the days to get to the holy days. God has holy days, which he instructs us to observe. And understanding and knowing those holy days is what makes it the Hebrew calendar, because the calendar observes to worship God on those particular days. However, we have to be very careful before we call the entire Hebrew calendar holy or sacred. In the past, our previous association used to send out these little cards with, oh, I don't know, seven, eight years in advance of when the holy days were. And the Worldwide Church of God called it uh, God's sacred calendar. 
Well, I'm not sure that you can call that calendar God's sacred calendar. It's a calendar. It's the Hebrew calendar, which has roots in the Semitic calendar, but it's specific days that are holy, not the entire calendar that's holy. So that's something that I just, I think is very important, a, a phraseology we don't want to use. So here's the conflict with the Semitic calendars and the solar year. And this brings in all kinds of arguments among religious people, particularly those who observe the Hebrew calendar. Knowledge of the completion of a solar year is essential for survival. A solar year is when the earth makes one complete revolution around the sun, measured from one vernal equinox to the next, and it equals 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes. Now in the Northern hemisphere, uh, the vernal equinox is when the sun is exactly above the, uh, the equator uh, and the day and night are of equal length. This is different from the solstices. This is a totally different thing than the solstices. So the thing that I want to emphasize is that the solar year is what determines the seasons. The solar year is what tells you the right time to plant crops. Now it's in, in contrast to the solar year, again, which is 365 days, it's common for the months of a lunar calendar to alternate between 29 and 30 days. If you've ever studied the Hebrew calendar, you'll see that. Since the period of 12 such lunations or lunar cycles, a lunar year is short. It's 354 days, eight hours and 48 minutes. So purely lunar calendars are 11 to 12 days shorter than the solar year. And this eventually causes the seasons to become distorted. You get out of season. And what it means is that you need, you must add time periodically, or you would get greatly out of sync with the solar year. In about 12 years, if you're losing 11 to 12 days a year, you'd be keeping the spring holy days in the fall. Instead of March or April, you'd be keeping them in September. So therefore, because the lunar calendar, the, the unilunar calendar loses days every year, you have to add days. And the adding of time is the process of intercalation. Now, again, there's a big debate and some people think that's wrong and some people think days should be added at certain times. The Hebrew calendar since the time of the Middle Ages or before, has had a particular structure. And one of those structures is to add a month every so many years, an entirely new month is added to the Hebrew calendar. And that's why sometime you might find yourself at the Feast of Tabernacles, for example, in um, uh, September. And then the next year it swings all the way uh, to October. And it's like, wow, what a difference in just one year. Well, that may have been the addition of a month that caused it to swing that much in one year. So would the Hebrews recognize the winter solstice? Well, the educated Hebrews and perhaps the priests were familiar with the winter solstice as they were very smart people. For example, Moses had an Egyptian education. He knew the Egyptian calendar. They worshiped the sun during the winter solstice. So he was aware of how it happens and why it's called that. The Egyptians again observed the winter solstice, but beyond acknowledging that it happens in the sky, they would not have celebrated it biblically. And I would say, I think confidently the average Israelite would have never even known that it happens and probably could care less. It is never mentioned as happening in the scriptures, and there's no reference to uh, the winter solstice or the summer solstice. Uh, obviously, worshiping the sun did happen. Uh, eventually, Israelite became disobedient. Israelites became disobedient, and they worshiped the sun, and that was a terrible thing, and it was one of the things that led them into captivity. But specifically, there is no comment 
about the winter solstice in the scriptures. As we know, the nation was cautioned against looking into the heavens for any kind of observations. And we read some scriptures earlier in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, Deuteronomy chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 4. So they were cautioned against even doing that. And for the, the average Israelite, it would have no influence on their own calendar observations. They had their own holy days to celebrate, which were designated for them. Uh, it held no special importance to them. Observing it didn't change their calendar observations at all. So from that perspective, it would have been of little interest to the average uh, Israelite at that time. So to recap the study tonight, what did we discuss? What are some of the things that we learned? Well, we defined what the winter solstice is and some history. And it was a time when people, particularly those who worshiped the sun, would, because of the obvious change in the amount of daylight and nighttime, would celebrate and would have festivities and festivals during the time of the winter solstice. Most ancients worshiped the sun throughout the world. And the winter solstice, again, was observed in China. It was observed in uh, the Americas by the, the ancient Indian populations. It was observed in Europe, Palestine, Africa. It's pretty much a universal acknowledgement and celebration. God specifically instructed the Israelites not to make a deity of any heavenly object. But unfortunately, Judah and Israel disobeyed God, and they did worship the sun through the idol of Molech that we're completely and fully aware of because of the writings of the Old Testament. And God instructed the Hebrews how to determine his holy days from a Semitic calendar that already existed. Again, I want to emphasize, God did not reveal to Moses a brand new, never heard of, never known before calendar he used the existing calendar that Moses was familiar with because he had been in Midian for 40 years, and he instructed him on how to know, how to observe the holy days from that calendar. As I said in my sermon last Sabbath, God works with people where they're at at any given period of time, and that's exactly what God did when he revealed his holy days. And those holy days and that calendar did not include an observance of the spring or winter solstice. Okay, that's our Bible study tonight. I like to try to keep it about 45 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. You should have the ability to do that. And I would be happy to answer any questions anyone might have or... Um, if you would uh, rather fellowship, you can uh, certainly begin doing that as well. Any questions or comments?